connected with. Yes, also, thank you um, for that. We have just recorded, so feel free to turn off your um, cameras if you like, or turn them on, whatever you prefer. Um, so here's the plan for today. Um, after we finish our welcome and intros, we have a first activity um, around the who and what of AI production. Then we'll have a bit on the big code approach to AI production. And then a second activity um, where we are um, going to try to reimagine the AI production pipeline together. And just to give you a really quick tour of the board, we're all here at the top right now, um, but soon to come are um, a series of frames with this lovely purple AI production pipeline, um, some more stickies, um, some information about big code and the big code pipeline down here. And then at the very end, you see um, we have um, some more pipelines, which we'll be using. Um, something you'll probably notice that the, is that there's stickies all over the board. They're there for you to use. So please use as many as you'd like. Um, and another place I'd like to introduce you to is right here, um, which is what we're calling our little brain freeze station. So if at any point um, you need some inspiration, you'd like to take a break from the session, or you just like to browse around, we have all kinds of articles over here. Um, and if there's something that um, you would like to share with the group, we have this section right here um, for you to share anything that's on your mind. So now to take us back, um, we do have some ground rules. I think at this point on the last day of MozFest, um, you are all probably pretty familiar with um, the community participation guidelines, but please let's, let's treat ourselves, um, yourselves and each other with respect. Um, please raise your hand if you, or use the chat if you have any questions or comments and please have fun. Just to point out that here we do have a Padlet. So if at any point you're having trouble with the, um, the Miro um, and you'd like to just share some thoughts directly into that pad um, to any of the questions, feel free to do so. So before we kick things off, I'd like to share a few quick grounding thoughts and definitions. Um, today and this whole week at MozFest, we've been having a conversation about moving towards more responsible and trustworthy AI. And given the past year, this is a conversation that really needs to be had. And while it's great that more tech companies are recognizing the need and starting these conversations within their own teams, we think that more importantly, this is the conversation that needs to be had in spaces like this, like MozFest, with people from all over the world, like you've shared um, in our first frame, um, and with all kinds of backgrounds. So today we want to invite you to lean on your background and represent your community. And together, let's start to reimagine what a better AI production pipeline could and should look like, guided not just by technical experts, but all of you in this digital room and your unique perspectives and expertise. So um, to kick things off, um, let's start with these, this definition slide right here. Uh, what do we mean by AI production pipeline? So these are the definitions we're working with today. Um, by AI production, we mean the process of building a machine learning model. By AI pipeline, we mean the steps that form AI production. And finally, uh, by data rights, what we mean is rights that are afforded to an individual or community relating to data they create or data that is about them. So these might not be formally recognized or officially in law yet, but um, by data rights, we just mean things that we think should exist. So now um, let's move on to our next frame and the AI production pipeline right here. And to do, to do so, I will now hand things over to Anne. Great. Um, thanks so much, Jen. So I'm just going to get sorted here by sharing Miro, and just to double check, is everyone able to see my screen all right? Yes, okay, great. Um, so to get us started to really, you know, think more about the AI production pipeline, you know, we're throwing a bunch of terms at you right now, but we really want to first go through the process of unpacking, you know, what kind of activities you might associate with that process. Um, it's commonly seen as a kind of black box that involves data, involves people, affects people. Um, but we'd really like to get you more of an idea of perhaps how you think about this process, maybe terms you might have heard, things that you yourself are involved in, um, to really ask the question, what kind of activities for you are part of the AI production pipeline? And we'll take 
maybe a couple of minutes here to just uh, using some of the stickies that are on the board here um, to really, you know, take a second to think through this process, um, whether that might be on the data collection side, the model training side, maybe it's eventual deployment in the world. I'm seeing some things here about creating data, about annotating it, about training a model, fine tuning a model, and human input, feedback, evaluating results. And just something to flag here on the bottom left side as well, that we have a couple of emojis that you are free to use. Um, if you see you know, something that you were thinking of that someone else might have put a sticky on, just feel free to copy paste some of these images down here if you're interested. Um, pointing out some things here, we have defining a, tra uh, a training objective, absolutely. Scraping the web, scraping data, absolutely. Defining categories to capture. Testing on diverse data sets, definitely. Thinking through, evaluating ethics. Deployment in the world and the use of APIs, licensing, monitoring model behavior and failures. Really interesting here. So it does seem like there is knowledge within the folks that are tuning into our session about these kind of different parts of what we are roughly grouping into three categories, right? The data collection process, the model training process, and the deployment process. We'll take maybe a minute or two, um, and then we'll move on to the next couple of boards. Feedback and evaluation from community members I'm seeing here. Making sure it works for different groups of people versioning, monetization, reinvestment. Reaching behind paywalls on the other end of the spectrum, data aggregators, legal remits. Great. So as, um, as we start to, later on, we'll return to these processes and to these different parts of what we're calling the AI production pipeline. We will return to this later, but for now, I invite you to kind of maybe step back from the board and take us further down into kind of two boards that we'll spend the next couple of minutes evaluating together. So we've asked about the, the how process, the what, right? The different elements and um, activities that are part of the AI production line. Um, now we'll go down into thinking more about, you know, who is a part of and who can shape that pipeline. And then in turn, after a couple of more minutes to ask, you know, who's impacted by this process. So if you want to follow me down to frame 14, um, we invite you to take, again, another, another couple of minutes to really ask, you know, who is a part of that process? Um, who can shape that process? And it could be folks that are visible or invisible. You might be a part of the AI production pipeline um, and know um, of different roles, of different types of, of work that are involved in that that may not be visible to the public. You may be a part of the publics that are affected by these systems um, that are feeding back into the process. Uh, really anything that comes to mind works here. I'm seeing ethics committees, C-suite business people, project managers, data scientists, software engineers, lawmakers, research engineers, everyone on the internet, data subjects, crowd workers, moderators, companies with computing resources, moderators, affected communities, funders, digital governance, designers, academics, everyone,
Perfect. And don't forget, if we want to copy paste some of these emojis here, if there are different, I'm going to add a maybe a fire and a heart one to the to the everyone pair over here. If there are ones that you empathize with, um, that you agree with, feel free to add them. Seeing digital governance, developers, military industrial complex, philosophers, NGOs, nonprofits. Investigative journalists. We're hoping that over the course of our very sh short time together, that we'll be able to unpack a little bit more of these three questions, maybe how they're tied to the, the what and the how. National funding bodies like the NSF, pedagogists, whistleblowers, It's so very interesting to see how folks are interpreting that question of who is a part of and can shape, um, which on one hand can, can mean who has power within the process, who can influence the process, but it can also mean how can one have impact within that process, um, really in any direction. Great community groups. We'll wait a little bit longer and then we'll move on to the next frame here. Make some of these over, group them together a little bit more. Great. Cool. All right. So now that we've you know asked the question of who is a part of and can shape the AI production pipeline, we're gonna maybe shift gears a little bit to ask ourselves, you know, who is impacted by this pipeline? And that could overlap, right? There, you could be talking about similar groups of people, um, similar positions, similar institutions. But if you want to come on over to the right with me to frame 15, um, we'll take a take a few more minutes to ask, you know, who's impacted by the process. And again, um, no wrong answers. Feel free to use the emojis in the lower left hand corner. Um, if you agree with uh, something that someone else has said, has put down into this board. I'm seeing artists, e-waste workers, miners, marginalized groups, police populations, the earth, future generations, everyone. crowd workers, voice actors, software users, non-technical people, racialized persons, patients, island communities. So in a similar way to what we were talking about with the previous slide, right, of who has, has influence um, within the AI production pipeline, similarly, it's this question of who is impacted um, can be in any direction, right? Who is impacted, who benefits, who does not benefit, who is harmed. Um, impact of being kind of broad, uh, broad term to encapsulate um, many different types of impact underpaid moderators, women, gender diverse persons, working class, writers, governments, different flavors of everyone. So we'll take maybe just one more minute um, and then 
uh, I promise you we'll be returning to these stickies, um, to these reflections. Really, thank you so much um, for thinking through the who, the what, the where, um, the how to get us started. All right, so feel free at any point to come back to these slides. We will return them to them later. Um, but what I'm going to do now is pass the mic over to Yasin, who will uh, walk us through um, big code, tell us a little bit more about the project, um, and then we'll come back into another kind of exercise together where we'll really try to kind of tie together this how and what is a part of the process and the who, who is impacted. Um, and who has the ability to influence this process as well. So uh, Yasin, on to you. Thank you all so much for your reflections. Uh, so hi, everyone. So I'm here representing uh, Big Code, which is an open and responsible research and development uh, collaboration for large language models for code. So uh, this is a project that is hosted by uh, two companies, Hugging Face and ServiceNow, but that aims to uh, develop a specific category of AI models in a way that's both most more responsible and more uh, transparent. Uh, people are, anyone is invited to join. Uh, there currently are over 500 participants from over 30 countries. Uh, the target uh, participants are mostly people with a primary research background, which can be a technical research background uh, working on the ethics of AI or uh, legal researchers. Uh, because much of the legal uh, landscape there is still being researched and being defined. Okay, so uh, the big question there was uh, the, what was going to be the object of this research and uh, what it is, is large language models for code. Uh, you might or might not have heard about those. Um, there was one product from Microsoft that made a lot of noise uh, that was Copilot. So that's when they advertised this system that was going to be a really useful coding assistant. Um, this is based on the technology of large language models. Uh, large language models have been in the news a lot recently, uh, so you might have heard of uh, the various versions of GPT, recently ChatGPT. Uh, large language models also support um, the recent Bing integration. Google is talking about using them in um, the main search interface. Uh, mostly what they do is uh, you take a model, a very large model, and you train it to predict the next word in a sentence. So here uh, we stole a slide from one of the coworkers in Big Code, Lubna, um, who wrote, so if as you're writing a sentence word by word, uh, the model tries to predict what the next word is going to be. And to do that is going to look at all of the sentences that look like what you've written so far in your training data and look at what people have written next in a uh, context like this one and tell you what uh, people have written next. The really fancy part about that is how you define what are similar sentences, right? For example, there might be other examples in the data set of someone having written, my name is uh, Lugna, but it might also be my name is Mark or whatever. And uh, the model really learns to combine all of those. So where it can get really exciting for applications is uh, if you use a model like that for code, right? So say you're typing code as a developer, uh, you want to know in a similar context as yours, what have other people written? Uh, one of the reasons why it's so useful for code is that code is uh, a low entropy data, which is to say that is very codified, right? So what you say next really depends on fewer factors than language in general. So you have this very powerful autocomplete, which uh, tells you, given what you've been doing so far, here's what you might want to be writing next. Uh, so you compare that, for example, going to Stack Overflow to figure out how to do something. Uh, this does a lot of job for you, right? It tells you like what questions you should be asking, what the context is, how you get all of that information, and um, what you could, how you could be writing the function that you're looking at. OK, so that's. Um, has been advertised as a really useful tool. Uh, hopefully it is. People have reported finding that it really helps their productivity when they're writing code. Uh, but going back to how it works, 
we said is going to tell you what other people who have written code have done in similar cases are the one you're interested in. So there's a valid question of whether those people who wrote that code intended for you as a user of the software to be able to leverage their work to uh, help with your own coding. And uh, that was one of the questions at the core of the Big Code project and of the constitution of its data set, which we call the stack. So the stack is a 6.4 terabytes uh, data set, which is huge of a code coming from GitHub. Uh, but there were a few choices that were made to reflect a desire to uh, use code that the writers wanted to be broadly useful. Uh, so we focused on a code that has an explicit license, which means that people were uh, putting out, it out as open source to be reused. Uh, a specific subset of permissive license, so we stayed away from licenses with attribution because we don't always know that the model is going to be able to tell you where it got its recommendations from. Um, and in addition, because people mostly licensed their code before they knew about the possibility of it being used in large language models, uh, we wanted to allow for the possibility that people might have put out that open source code, but not want it to be used in uh, training uh, large language models. So on top of selecting those licenses to uh, reflect the data subject's intention, we set out an opt-out mechanism, which means that anyone can come in, say, uh, hey, I see you have my data in this data set. Uh, I would like you not to use it. Please remove it. Uh, and then we'll remove it and uh, from future versions of the data set and require people to use the latest version of the data set uh, to uh, support that opt-out. So a lot of it is in making that opt-out as easy as possible to enact. So we built a couple of tools for that. Uh, one, there's uh, something that lets you, the Am I in the Stack application lets you see whether code under your username in GitHub is included. Uh, you can follow up with a mostly automated opt-out requests that will go through your GitHub ID uh, to let us know that you want your code removed. Um, and then we follow through by removing it and uh, any further uses of the data set or any models used on future versions of the data set are going to not include your data. Um, so there are some questions about whether like that is enough, but we thought that it was very important to at least commit to honoring the agency of data subjects and have a first step into making them a full stakeholder of the development of the data set. Uh, so that is one of the important uh, steps I think we took in data uh, governance. Um, you might have heard about other issues with those code data sets. Uh, one is, for example, if you're a developer yourself, you know that sometimes it's tempting to like put your uh, hard code, your ID or your logins into your code. Uh, so models that you're training might learn that and then propose your ID to other people. We want to um, avoid that happening as much as possible. So we're doing a PI reduction step to remove uh, secrets and ideas. Um, and uh, we also want to uh, train a model that's going to be used for safer or most positive use cases. This is still very much very uh, new technology. Uh, so we did a lot of work on the license of the model uh, so that it is released for research uh, to be used by anyone, but not necessarily for any purpose. So we have use case restrictions to stay away from the more dangerous and the least tested uh, applications. Cool. So um, that's like an overview of some of the things that we did. Again, it's a big project with lots of parallel threads, uh, but hopefully that gets you a sense of some of the questions that came up in practice uh, when thinking about specific kind of AI model. Uh, and I think I'm giving it back to uh, Jen to go over the next activity. Uh, yes, now. thank you very much. Um, so before we wanted to move towards challenging all of you or inviting all of you, I should say, um, to think about um, what kind of AI pipeline you think should exist. We wanted to share um, after Yusin's presentation, this example of the big code pipeline in the framework we have. I see that there are some questions in the chat for people already raising um, concerns and questions they have around the use of copyrighted data sets um, 
or data sets that have copyrighted material in them, um, and also how um, models like big code might um, interact with open source licensed code as data. Um, so I don't know if that's something you might want to answer in the chat, Yasin, um, or maybe it's something we can explore as we redesign um, some new pipelines in our next activity. Uh, but before we do that, we wanted to share this pipeline as an example um, to show how um, Big Code has really expanded um, the uh, more simplified framework that we had earlier of just data collection, model training, and model deployment um, with these additional steps, like the ones that you all raised before around the different activities that are part of AI production. So in the case of the code, um, there is the procuring and storing of data, uh, the processing and filtering out um, of certain kinds of data, such as um, the anonymization of PII, um, creating a public data sheet for the data set, um, defining the model architecture and training objectives, um, obtaining infrastructure in order to actually train the model, evaluating the model, creating a demo, um, like the Santa Coder model um, demo so that users can actually access the model and interact with it. Then um, integrating the model into a product or platform for further access. Um, and on the final end, um, creating a public model card, monitoring real world use cases to make sure that they don't violate the license that um, the code has. Uh, and then potentially in, in future assessing compliance with that model license. So um, to give a little bit more color um, to the specific tools that Big Code has created to support um, their responsible um, AI production pipeline, I'll now hand it back over to Yasin um, to share a little bit more info about some of these tools. Uh, I also like didn't, I'm not sure where the questions are coming in. Uh, I was looking for those. Um, but let me go back to what we have here. Um, okay, so uh, program storing the data sets. Uh, so this is done uh, through the GitHub uh, API where, oh, thanks, the questions are coming in. Um, Um, I'm sorry, I got a little turned around. Sorry for distracting you with, with all those <laughs> questions. Um, I'm glad these are all coming in and hopefully these are all ones that we can address. Um, but for now, Yassine, if this sounds okay, if you could just introduce some of these, these tools at the bottom of the pipeline here. Um, Absolutely, thanks for yeah, taking me back. Um, Okay, so you can go see all of those tools. We are trying to make them as accessible as possible. Uh, you can go, they're mostly hosted as spaces on Hugging Face. Uh, so for example, you have the first one, uh, am I in the stack? Uh, so here, if you go and click there and put your uh, username, this will go through the preprocessed data set in current version and tell you all of the repositories that were included in the data sets that are under your username. Um, we chose to, enact data governance at the username uh, level, which means that you get to remove anything that you own on GitHub. The idea was to mirror how GitHub uh, native governance works, uh, to not like reinvent the wheel about who should be able to make decisions for what parts of the code. So once you have gone to Am I in the stack and found your repo, this will op give you a personal link uh, to open an issue. So how that works is you click that, this automatically open an issue that we can look at, which lets us check that you are requesting to remove code that you actually own, but we try to make it like one click so that it's really easy. Uh, and where then we go through those manually and remove anything that you've requested removed. Um, we also have a demo for how uh, PIA anonymization works because uh, removing private information is still very much an open project. So we want transparency about how good the tools that we're playing are and also getting some feedback about what they might be missing. Uh, again, like we encourage you to go and uh, look at those and play with those as much as possible. Uh, so another tool uh, kind of per, like orthogonal to the questions of opt-out are uh, how people can understand what's in the code. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the things that we've done to allow that is uh, having a search in the data set. So if you're, for example, you have your own codes uh, that you have written and you want to check whether there are versions that are not in your uh, repos, you can do a full text search to see whether they're somewhere else, whether someone else have, might, might have reused it and then relicensed it. Uh, you can also see if you're looking, uh, if you're getting a completion from a model trained on the data set, get a sense of uh, where that completion came from, what's recommended, where it's doing its recommendation. So we found that having a full text search was really useful in the data set. Uh, we have already trained some models on this data set, uh, and there's a public demo that you can use to get a sense of what the model has learned. So go to the demo right away. And uh, we have this license that we uh, just mentioned. Uh, so some of the use case restrictions of the license reflect things that are already being discussed or coming up in regulations. So don't use the models to uh, intentionally try to uh, reuse people's private information. Uh, don't use the model to uh, generate malware. Uh, don't use the model to uh, facilitate uh, misinformation. And don't use the model to generate code without disclosing that you use the model. I think those are some of the main ones, but uh, I absolutely uh, recommend that you go and have a look at uh, the full text of that license. Thank you so much, Yassine. And thank you all for all these questions. Um, we'll try to answer them um, as best we can. Uh, but for now, I will stop sharing and hand things back over to Anne for our final activity. All right. Um, great. And Yes, definitely with these questions, it would be great if we had some maybe time at the end where we could pass the mic over to discuss some of them more so in depth. But um, we did want to leave time throughout our workshop together, and I will share my screen in a moment, to really end on the question of how can we reimagine the AI production pipeline process? Um, so often when we're talking about impacts, who is the part of the process, where power lies, um, what kinds of activities were a part of it, it can often leave us feeling like, you know, we can't reimagine that process, that we can't necessarily change that process. And it's really inter interesting to hear about Yasin's work because of the way in which it is trying to shift um, and introduce new projects in order to shift um, uh, shift the needle on how um, how AI production is done. And so with that, I will share my screen here. Um, Thanks for being patient with us, though, as we ping pong a little bit. Um, really, our last, uh, maybe we'll say 10, 15 minutes together, uh, will be a series of exercises that bring us back into asking, you know, what kind of activities in your view and in your experiences um, coming from your embodied experience um, should be a part of the AI production pipeline, um, centering those that are impacted by it. Um, and so what we mean by this is that we have set up uh, six different boards here, bringing some slides over some, some of the, um, the names, the populations, the groups that you all had mentioned at the beginning of our session together um, to really ask what kind of process would you introduce into AI production in order to center that group more specifically. Um, so we have one here on frame 33, which would be future generations. Uh, one on 34, um, uh, foreign with policed populations. Uh, 35 is uh, foreign with artists. 36 is people in the global south. Um, and 37 focused on minors. And 38 um, is a blank in case uh, anyone would like to introduce or work on a particular topic. And so we ask that in the next 15 minutes here, um, that we are not going to divide folks into breakout rooms. We're going to keep you all in this collective space together. Um, but we ask that if you're interested in a particular topic, hop on over to that board and use some of these stickers from Sticklandia um, to really you know, think through maybe the process of activities that can be a part of that pipeline. And maybe just to make that timer a little bit easier, if you'd like to keep the timeline in mind, um, we have a, um, a cuckoo clock, which I will put 15 minutes on it um, and drop it in the Zoom chat here. 
and in case you'd like to keep that time in mind, but I'll mostly be staying quiet, um, maybe seeing a couple of things that are popping up um, on your respective boards. All right, folks, we're, we're still, we have 10 minutes on the clock, but I'm going to do a quick tour of the boards as they're developing. Don't worry if you're stuck. Um, this is really a place to reimagine this process um, with communities, with um, folks that are affected by AI in mind. So I'm going to go on a little digital tour here. We have uh, keeping in mind future generations, the ability for uh, data to die, to be removed, um, to report on carbon emissions, research on the controllability of systems and its effects, um, algorithmic disgorge, disgorgement, I want to say disgorgement, um, definitely destroying models uh, that companies scale up for general use, definitely. Really interested in how this board develops, um, keeping in mind uh, 
you know, 50 years down the line, 100, 100 years down the line, generations down the line, um, what will have to be included in the process in order to center future generations that will inevitably be influenced and affected by them. Um, here we have activities that should be a part of the pipeline for and with artists. We have the ability to see if the art is being used, um, to request that the art is removed from the training process, making sure not to steal IP, um, working with artists to see what can be done with AI, as opposed to AI replacing art, for example. We have making sure the output is not weird. Uh, receiving credit uh, when others are using their work, receiving money from models that use their work, using AI as an accessibility tool. There are lots to unpack in every single one of these boards, and I wish we had time to, to be able to go through each of these points separately. Um, we're really thanking you for your, your reflections. Um, we have this one that is for and with minors, uh, with this in mind in the data collection process, especially. Um, introducing fair economic models for raw material extraction, nationalizing open AI and other companies working with large language models, building partnerships with governments in Latin America and Africa to steward hardware and software aspects, enforceable laws regarding ex data extraction and consent, large companies giving a percentage of their profits for training data from Wikipedia, on the middle of training side, we have limiting computing access to public utilities. And again, very much looking forward to how this, um, how this board develops. All right, and we have a little bit more of a tour here. Going up to what kinds of activities should be a part of the pipeline for and with people in the global south. The right to shape uh, what data is and isn't being used to inform data selection history from the point, many points of view, not only by European colonizers with regards to training models, to be a part of the production and the design of some of the data subjects and annotators, um, which does involve uh, a vast amount of precarious labor. And then again, very much looking forward to seeing um, this board develop in the last five minutes or so that we have. And finally, um, who, what kinds of activities should be a part of the pipeline for and with police populations, with balanced populations, stricter data collection, um, laws and regulations, community-based data collection agreements, avoiding reinforcing stereotypes, models being developed in partnership with communities, um, and on the, as well as ability to interrogate models easily and audit um, how they work as well as requesting poorly performing models to not be used. And it, we can really see how in actually many of these different doors that there could be elements of perhaps one model that's being thought of with regards to artists that actually can also work with regards to police populations in the sense of, are we including them in the process, in the collection process, in the training process, in the deploying process, um, in the data extraction and in, um, uh, collection process, uh, questions that may apply while centering minors may also apply in the case of um, folks in the global south, um, from which extraction has historically um, and in the current day still occurs. And all of this, of course, uh, under this kind of veil of thinking about the future generations that are impacted by these technologies, um, thinking about them often includes thinking about really everyone in turn. So I'll mute myself at these last five minutes. Um, You're still muted, Jen. Sorry, intentionally muted. <laughs> um, we'll be back in just a few minutes. Thanks, Asinda.
who just flag into that there's a really interesting discussion happening in the chat. Um, I am going to copy paste these questions um, into the board as well uh, for visibility's sake, uh, but just to flag that the conversation happening there and this question around how other LLMs business models work. Um, but maybe to close it off in the last two minutes before uh, we end this exercise, um, I'll pass it on to Yasin to ask the question of, you know, how is the Bigfoot project at thinking about this reimagining process in turn? And, and maybe are you also looking at the what's emerging from these boards and from this reimagining that folks have joined us here to, to do today um, that you see in, in your own work? Um, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, I'm looking at that. And it's always, you know, uh, seeing all of those ideas is both super encouraging and also uh, like draws light on the immensity of what needs to be done to do those things more responsibly. Um, there's lots of trends coming in. A lot is about uh, controlling what data is represented and how data is represented. Um, one of the main things that I think both Big Code and its predecessor, Big Science, were um, aiming for is transparency in the data without necessarily uh, making it a free for all to reuse. So in Big Code, that looked like a mandatory update of the data set to uh, honor people's right to be forgotten. In Big Science, it looked like uh, not releasing all of the data, but giving people tools to explore of the data, which lets people see whether and what perspective are represented in the data set or not, and whose uh, work is represented in the data set or not. I see there are a couple of questions about uh, the uh, environmental impact um, and uh, something about using public resources. Uh, that's also something that's really important, which is that um, it's one thing to get like guesstimates of the carbon costs, but as we've seen during this project and the previous one, um, the best way to quantify the uh, imp environmental impact is to have transparency about the exact data centers and computer centers that are used. And that's something that we have a lot more uh, control over when those models are trained on public infrastructure. So Big Science was the Jean Zeko computer, and now it's a mix of uh, other computers. Um, lots of the questions are about how things are regulated and uh, how the models are used. Um, so Big Code kind of started from this point that the uh, large language models for codes were being used. So given that, given that we don't have control over like what other people have done before, we looked at ways that that could be done a little better or a little with a little more control. Um, the approach is both super like encouraging and grounded, but also inherently limited, right? Because there's a choice that is made to use data at scale to build that technology. So we're trying to see like what the limits of that. If we make a, made that choice, what's the best that we can do? Uh, yes, so many, so many good questions there. Um, I think one thing to say also uh, is we're trying to work with uh, governance processes that are different timescales. So like developing new models, you see a release every three months. Uh, developing community norms, it takes a lot of conversation, a lot of events over timelines of months or years. And developing new regulations, uh, we are like starting to learn how to implement the GDPR, which like is a process that started in 2000, depending how you count 2009 or 2012. So we're talking about years to decades. Um, so managing all of those things and being at the right level of seeing what's uh, legal or not, whenever where legality is enough or not, and how we can give people technical options to uh, align with legal discourse, uh, legal vocabulary, and legal notions um, is something that unfortunately has to be done ahead of the law catching up sometimes. So that's kind of where we're experimenting with uh, new versions of doing opt-out that are in the spirit of the law while the laws are being worked on and passed, um, or new versions of controlling what the model is going to be used for. Um, cool. So both tons of work to do, but also encouraging that there are some steps that we can take uh, in all of those projects. Thank you so much, Yasin. Um, we hope that we're closing off in the last two minutes of the session together. 
And we hope that, you know, learning more about what Hugging Face is working on, having the chance to have uh, an opportunity to think through, you know, the who, the what, the how, what can we build um, to really, really reimagine that process together um, can give us maybe an opportunity or some hope and some tools uh, to really be able to be a part of the process, um, as well as to, you know, really think about its impacts um, and how what we can do to, to change it as well. So um, I really like what you said, Yasmin, about working together to think about the technical elements alongside the, the legal elements, um, alongside perhaps uh, the discussions happening here about how do we involve uh, impacted populations in that development process itself. Um, so with that, I can do a really rapid fire tour, but I think in the minute that we ha now have left, um, we're going to spend maybe 30 seconds giving you some last resources and links um, for you to continue this conversation elsewhere and um, to learn more about our respective uh, communities. Um, we also want to flag that these boards will be open um, past MOSFET, so you'll feel free to come back here to uh, think more about a frame, um, to think more about this process. Feel free to use this um, this process in your own work um, and in your own workshops. Um, get in touch with us, maybe uh, Jenna, Yasin, if you want to drop some of our contact details in the chat. Um, but we have a contact board here if you want to go down below past uh, these last activity boards. Um, we have our emails and contact information um, on frame 43, uh, but also want to plug uh, the Big Code project um, as well as uh, the Turing Way. Um, and you'll feel free to join us in other community events that are upcoming um, to be a part of uh, the communities of communities that are really trying to, to shape, to talk about, um, to discuss, to bring in folks that may not normally be in these conversations um, here into this space too. So thank you so much for joining us. We're at the top of the hour um, and we hope to see you in another one of these community spaces. And thank you again so much for your questions and we'll um, maybe try and add answers in the Miro board as well um, to keep the discussion going on there. So thank you all so much. <laughs>